shocking scene after a fiery small plane crash in a residential Southern California neighborhood. Homes destroyed, emergency crews racing to search for victims. Go! Tonight, the American drug maker that's asking the FDA for authorization for a pill that it says cuts the risk of hospitalization and death from COVID in half. The decision potentially coming in just a matter of weeks. If it gets the green light, it would be the first authorized treatment that does not require an IV or injection. This comes as cases and deaths continue to drop as we approach Halloween. Tonight, the message from Dr. Fauci. Tonight, the nationwide Southwest flight chaos. Thousands of flights canceled. Passengers remain stranded what the airline has to say about the crisis and when the situation could be back to normal. The tale of two Texas counties and perhaps two pandemics. What was your level of trust with what your health care providers were telling you about getting the vaccine? Oh, very, very, it was very high. I'm a believer in science. We're on the ground in one of the most vaccinated areas in America and one where far fewer than 50% of adults have a shot. You don't have to die. This doesn't, your story doesn't have to end like ours. Tonight, we are learning about a dramatic FBI sting that helped nab a Navy engineer accused of trying to sell secrets about nuclear powered submarines to foreign countries. The engineer and his wife arrested. Among the allegations, he hid secret data on a memory card in a peanut butter sandwich. They're used to running in extreme heat and cold, putting their bodies through some of the most grueling activities humans can handle. But even these ultramarathon runners needed rescuing when a blizzard suddenly moved in. The harrowing stories of survival from a weekend race gone wrong. And it had been 85 years since a working journalist won the Nobel Peace Prize until now. We are joined tonight by one of the journalists awarded the prestigious honor, why she says her award must spur a global call to action. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We begin tonight with a dose of hope in the fight to end this pandemic in the form of a first of its kind pill and also a dash of normalcy two and a half years in the making as thousands participated in the first Boston Marathon since the start of the pandemic. The FDA is now reviewing Merck's data on its new pill. The company says if taken every 12 hours for five days, it cuts the risk of hospitalization and death in half. But health officials say the first line of defense is still to be vaccinated. And this week, an FDA advisory panel is set to meet on the Moderna and J&J &J boosters and to also determine if Americans can mix vaccines from different makers. But in Boston today, celebration as the 125th annual running of the Boston Marathon went off without a hitch. Crowds lining up to cheer on the roughly 18,000 runners who took part. Every runner had to either provide proof of vaccination or produce a negative COVID-19 test. Our Trevor Alt leads us off tonight from Boston. Tonight, a symbol of hope in a nation eager to turn the corner on the pandemic. 18,000 determined athletes at the first Boston Marathon in two and a half years. Well, we were pumped. We're excited to finally like have it back and, you know, back to the way it used to be. Thousands lining the streets to cheer them on. The field thinned down from years past for social distancing, each runner showing proof of vaccination or a negative test. I was supposed to run this last year. It was my 2020 race, which I qualified years ago. And so we had to wait a while, but I'm glad to be here. The race coming as the country continues to make positive strides against the virus. Cases, hospital admissions, and deaths all trending down. But health officials warn we have not yet crossed the finish line. That sea of red on this map marking areas that still have high transmission. I'd like to see it well below 10,000 and even much lower than that. But when you're at 95,000, that's still a situation where you have a high degree of dynamic circulation of virus in the Got community. It. Still a green light for more vaccine booster shots is expected soon. An FDA panel will meet Thursday to review Moderna and on Friday, a review of Johnson & Johnson booster shots along with the potential for mixing different vaccines. And doctors could soon have a new weapon to help drive those hospitalization numbers down. Today, Merck asking for emergency authorization from Molnupirnavir, the first antiviral pill designed to fight COVID. The company says in trials, the drug cut hospitalizations in half for people at risk for severe disease. Merck's drug can be taken at home Home, four pills every 12 hours for five days. And it's about 50% effective at preventing hospitalization. But remember, the vaccine is virtually 99% effective at preventing hospitalization. You'd much rather prevent getting the illness than treating it once you've already gotten it.
Back in Boston, physical therapist Joy Danaher has seen the struggle of those battling the virus. She says their perseverance inspired her to run today. They're the reason that I was that I did this and that I that I finished because like I said, there were times I wanted to just stop and walk. But you couldn't. Nope. Because they couldn't. Right. They can't. They have no choice. I had a choice. And so I kept going. Love that she was encouraged on by her patients. Trevor Alt joins us now from Boston. And Trevor, once the FDA authorizes boosters for the other two vaccines, what's the timeline for what happens next? Yeah, so Lindsay, assuming that authorization is granted by the FDA, a CDC panel would then meet within days and then the director can give her approval. And we're expecting really to potentially see more booster shots rolling out for Moderna and Johnson & Johnson as early as the end of next week, Lindsay. And meanwhile, some encouraging words from Dr. Fauci over the weekend on Halloween trick-or-treating. Tell us what he had to say about that. Yeah, it's not, frankly, it's not often that you get to say encouraging words coming from Dr. Fauci on a holiday, Lindsay, not to say that as a, a slur or a slam on Dr. Fauci. He just usually is telling us to be careful. He's telling us now to enjoy Halloween. Go out and enjoy your trick-or-treating because it frequently is outside. He is saying it's a good time to reflect on your vaccination status. If you haven't gotten your shot yet, it's a good idea to go get it. If you have gotten it, it's a sign just like the Boston Marathon that maybe we're turning the corner here and we're a little bit safer and we can go out and trick-or-treat and enjoy ourselves on the holiday. And that really, Lindsay, is something to cheer about. We can hear the revelry all around you. Trevor, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Next to the travel nightmare for thousands of passengers across the country after Southwest Airlines canceled more than 2,200 flights in just the last three long days. Take a look at the long lines in Denver's airport. Southwest is blaming a variety of things, including, quote, weather and other external constraints. But does the FAA disagree or agree with them? ABC's transportation correspondent Gio Benitez has more. Tonight, problems with Southwest Airlines flights causing an extraordinary mess at airports across the country. What we're seeing here at Dallas Love Field Airport is basically a domino effect from the weekend. Fabricia Amara's teenage daughter is trying to get from Houston to Miami to see her neurosurgeon. She has a mass on her brain. They did not handle it properly. They did not. They have no answers for you. They, they tell you that uh, nothing that we can do. Since Saturday, Southwest Airlines has canceled more than 2,200 flights, blaming the multi-day mess on air traffic control issues and bad weather, today adding other external constraints. But the FAA firing back, saying no FAA air traffic staffing shortages have been reported since Friday, and that the issues some airlines are seeing are due to aircraft and crews being out of place. We spoke with the head of the Southwest Pilots Union, who says this is not a fight between the union and the company. This is because of bad staffing. Until the company makes some changes in how they're doing business internally and scheduling our pilots, we're going to continue to see the problem. This just sounds like this is a problem that could continue to keep happening. Gio Benitez joins us now. And Gio, conditions slowly improving, but what is the airline saying tonight? So, Lindsay, basically, Southwest has just said that they are trying their best to get this going again, but it will not be back to normal overnight. We will still see cancellations and delays over the next few days. It may take several days to get this going again because it is not with the flip of a switch when you can fix these issues, especially the ones that Southwest is facing. Understood. And, Gio, we've also seen chaos with American Airlines this summer, now Southwest. Walk us through why it takes so long. You say it's not a flip of a switch, but to fix these staffing issues in the airline industry. And that's a really good question, Lindsay, because we see that there are lots of jobs in the airline industry. We see that airlines are indeed hiring people. The problem is, whether you're a customer service agent or a pilot, it takes months and months of training to get them into the system and make sure that they are properly checked out securely and they make sure that they have all of that training to get those jobs under control there. Lindsay. Gio Benitez, thanks so much. Now to that alleged spy plot, a nuclear engineer for the Navy and his wife accused of attempting to sell secret U.S. submarine technology to a foreign country, allegedly even exchanging information hidden in a peanut butter sandwich and a pack of gum. ABC's Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas has the details. At first glance, they look like a typical suburban couple. But tonight, their neighbors are wondering if Jonathan Toby and his wife Diana have betrayed their country. 
willing to sell some of the nation's most sensitive secrets about our most sophisticated nuclear submarines. I was shocked. I guess you never know what's going on in people's homes. According to the FBI, the story begins in April 2020 when the couple reached out to an undisclosed country, allegedly pitching the elaborate scheme. At one point writing, please forward this letter to your military intelligence agency. This is not a hoax. Allegedly up for sale, the design of the Virginia-class nuclear submarine, which utilizes the latest in stealth technology at a cost of $3 billion each. It's some of the most closely held technology and the deepest secrets that the U.S. government has. Toby was a nuclear engineer working at the U.S. Navy with a high-level national security clearance. Several times over months, the FBI says, he allegedly left computer files at secret drop-off locations in West Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Virginia. His wife, an Annapolis school teacher, at times allegedly serving as a lookout. In one drop, the couple allegedly hid an encrypted file in a peanut butter sandwich. In others, in a Band-Aid wrapper and chewing gum package. But it was all a sting orchestrated by the FBI after that undisclosed nation reached out to the U.S. Pierre Thomas joins us now from the couple's neighborhood. They'll be in court tomorrow facing multiple charges. What's expected there, Pierre? And any details on that undisclosed country? Lizzie, for now, that country is asking not to be identified. If convicted, the couple faces up to life in prison, and prosecutors are asking that they be held without bond because the FBI believes that they would try to flee. They may have the money to run, Lindsay. The FBI claims they were paid $100,000 as a part of this scheme. Pierre Thomas, our thanks to you. Now to the investigation into the January 6th riot and exclusive new reporting about what sources say President Trump was doing as his supporters stormed the Capitol as he watched on TV in his private dining room. And also new details on the lengths the former president went to in questioning the results of the election and allegedly trying to get them overturned before he left office. Here's ABC's chief Washington correspondent, Jonathan Carl. In an indication of just how far then-President Trump was willing to go to overturn the election, he asked the nation's top intelligence official, Director of National Intelligence John Ratcliffe, to look into whether wireless thermostats made in China were being used to control voting machines in Georgia, flipping votes from Trump to Biden, according to a source who witnessed Trump's request. It's one of many revelations about Trump's actions during the days leading up to January 6th in my upcoming book, Betrayal, the final act of the Trump show. The crazy conspiracy theory, two sources tell me, was pushed by Jeffrey Clark, the obscure Justice Department official Trump wanted to make the acting attorney general just days before the January 6th riot. Now President Biden has decided to turn over confidential White House documents to Congress related to what Trump, his aides, and members of his family were up to during the riot. It's a move Trump vows to fight as a violation of executive privilege, but the Biden White House says it's about learning the truth. He believes it to be of the utmost importance for both Congress and the American people to have a complete understanding uh, of the events of that day to prevent them from happening again. One thing certain to be of interest to the House committee investigating January 6th is related to the controversial video Trump released more than two hours after the Capitol was breached. Trump told his supporters to go home, but he also praised them. We love you. You're very special. In betrayal, I revealed that a source who was with Trump when he made the video told me that Trump recorded multiple versions that were deemed unacceptable by his aides because he praised the rioters, but he didn't tell them to go home. I'm told those outtakes were videotaped by White House videographers, are government property, and would provide insight into Trump's state of mind on that day. In reporting for Betrayal, I spoke to several people who were in contact with Trump during the riot. Trump, the sources say, was watching TV in his private dining room. He liked what he saw. He boasted about the size of the crowd, and he argued with aides who wanted him to call on his supporters to stop rioting. The book reveals more details about Kevin McCarthy's call to Trump as the rioters stormed the House chamber. According to a source familiar with the call, McCarthy, frustrated at Trump's indifference, said, I just got evacuated from the Capitol. There were shots fired right off the House floor. You need to make this stop. The source said Trump pushed back, saying, quote, they are just more upset than you because they believe it more than you, Kevin, referring to the lie that the election had been stolen. 
Jonathan Carl joins us now. John, in your work on this book, you've interviewed President Trump about January 6th. Let's play a portion of, of what he told you months later. So you, you tweeted that night, remember this day forever. What, what did you want people to remember about it? Um, I was uh, referring to numerous things, but also the main thing that, look, until I saw what was going on, that was a very beautiful time with extremely loving and friendly people. The largest crowd I've ever spoken before with tremendous spirit. And I'm referring to that. He doesn't seem to be shying away from embracing that day at all. No, Lindsay, I, I'll tell you, and, and he went on. And it seems, it seemed to me, a, as I talked to him at length about that day, uh, that the one thing that he regretted was that he didn't, and these are his words, that he didn't get credit for the size of the crowd uh, that turned out, uh, that, that, that these, quote, fake news didn't give him credit uh, for how many people came out to see. He told me it was the largest crowd uh, he had ever spoken before. But I, I, I sense not one bit of regret or remorse about what happened. There was a quick reference as I was speaking to him uh, that it was marred later on. I guess marred later on refers uh, to, the, uh, to the insurrection at the Capitol, the, the, the storming of the Capitol building. But no, he looks back quite fondly on January 6th. Yeah, really fascinating that the focus would be on the crowd size uh, considering that day. Uh, many Republicans distanced themselves from the president immediately after January 6th, but it seems like we're, we're not seeing so much of that anymore. Yeah, I mean, you saw in the immediate aftermath of, of the riot, you know, only 10 Republicans in the House voted to impeach him, seven voted to convict him uh, in the trial in, in the Senate. But many, many Republicans, Mitch McConnell, Kevin McCarthy, were quite critical of Trump's actions, said that he bore responsibility uh, for what happened. Uh, but you see almost none of that now. Uh, McCarthy is obviously very much uh, tied to, to Trump in every way politically. And uh, just over the weekend, Trump was in Iowa, Chuck Grassley, as establishment a Republican as you can have, 88-year-old uh, senator, uh, was there on stage uh, with Trump in Iowa, uh, eagerly accepting his endorsement. Jonathan Carl, thanks so much. We, of course, look forward to much more of your reporting in your book, Betrayal, which comes out November 16th. Thank you, Lindsay. Now to a miracle in Texas. Three-year-old Christopher Ramirez is back home from the hospital tonight after following the family dog into the woods and then going missing for four days. ABC's Marcus Moore spoke exclusively with a man who police say was a good Samaritan who found the boy. And Marcus now brings us the latest. Tonight, a moment of celebration in this Texas town. Three-year-old Christopher Ramirez is finally home. His mother, Araceli Nunez, holding on tight to her son. Estoy muy contenta de tener a mi hijo en mis brazos. Christopher was found Saturday morning after he was missing for four days. The child was found alive. He is alive. He's thirsty. He's with his mother and he's going to the hospital. A landowner, Tim Halfen, found him in a thick wooded area five miles from his home after hearing about the missing boy during Bible study, setting out to search for Christopher on his own. I'm walking back down the pipeline toward where I live and I hear that noise. And now I'm saying, Christopher? And then he responds. <laughs> this image taken Saturday of Christopher reunited with his mom. I asked her about that moment. ¿Cómo fue ese momento para usted? No puedo explicarles con palabras. She calls his discovery a miracle. And tonight, the little boy who survived, who loves police officers and firefighters, is now the Grimes County Sheriff's Office's newest member. It's my honor to pin him the badge, junior deputy badge. He certainly deserves that badge. I've heard that that's actually part of the Navy SEAL training, right? To go out in the wilderness and survive on your own for, for three days. And here you have a three-year-old who's already accomplished that. Marcus Moore, kind enough to join us now. Marcus, what are you hearing from authorities at this time? Are, are they still looking into trying to figure out what happened? Yeah, Lindsay, they are. I asked the sheriff if this is case closed, and he said no, that it's not, that uh, federal and state investigators are, are still doing their work, looking at every aspect of this case. And uh, But he maintains his belief that there was absolutely no foul play in this case, and he, like so many others, are just glad that Christopher is back with his mom. Just a remarkable story all around. Marcus Moore, our thanks to you. When we come back, the deadly scene of small plane crashing into a delivery truck, home set on fire, a neighborhood in shock.
And we're continuing to track the latest as more workers go on strike across the country. But up next, our journey to two Texas counties. One is at 98% vaccination and the other among the lowest anywhere in the country. What we learned and what these counties show us about how difficult it will be to reach herd immunity. That story is coming up next. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded by no people squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. <laughs> Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Hi, <laughs> how cute. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. This is American history, a violent white mob, a brutal attack, 300 black Americans killed right here in America. Now, it is time to uncover Tulsa's buried truth, the gripping story brought to light in a new podcast from ABC News, available now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Sex, gambling, fraud, betrayal, and murder. Cutthroat Inc., the podcast. The a family truth. on a mission to find their son. A year's worth of conversations with the killer. Cutthroat Inc. Subscribe for free now on your favorite podcast app. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. Now with so much on the line, more Americans are turning to David Muir and ABC's World News Tonight than any other program across all of television. Investigators are trying to piece together what led a small twin engine plane to barrel into a California neighborhood. The plane plowed into a delivery truck, setting two homes on fire just blocks from a high school in the city of Santee, which is outside of San Diego. We were told of at least two fatalities from this tragic incident. And now we want to take you to America's second largest state, Texas. And in the front line in America for the debate over vaccination, through the power of persistence, one rural county has convinced nearly every single person there to get a shot, while in another Lone Star State county is a far different story. Our Will Carr has this tale of two counties. As the debate to get vaccinated wages on across the country, there's a part of South Texas where the wind is strong the horses graze calmly on the farms and the sunsets sprawl across the border. As Lone Star counties go, this rugged, remote area lacks cell phone service and spots and GPSs tend to run out of directions. But when it comes to human interaction, communication has never been stronger. This is Presidio County, home to Texas's highest vaccination rate. Nearly every eligible resident, just over 7,800, has been fully vaccinated. That's 98% of the county, including Rosindo Scott, a Vietnam vet who's battling ALS. What was your level of trust with what your health care providers were telling you about getting the vaccine? Oh, very, very, it was very high. I'm a believer in science. Presidio County, home to Marfa, a community of artists, runs blue. Residents voted for Democrats in all of the recent presidential elections, but it's not 98% blue, not even close. In fact, when it comes to health, residents don't see colors, only distance. Many live hours from the closest hospital. That in and of itself has been a key reason why they've been so eager to roll up their sleeves. 
we're so isolated that we could easily just fall like dominoes if something wasn't done. Scott's wife, Allison, is his chief caretaker. She's also the high school principal. We've not had any COVID cases since school started, and that's in our pre-K through 12th grade. And what do you attribute that to? I think the high vaccination rate. What the COVID pandemic has done is rural healthcare organizations, they're like small football teams. We have very few, if anybody, on the bench to pull for relief. We had to shut down our medical and dental service lines and our behavioral health service lines on these days that we just, you know, did 500 or 600 vaccines at a time because we didn't have the people to pull off the bench. According to Dr. Adrian Billings, it's taken painstaking persistence to get shots into arms. This one lone hospital serves this vast 12,000 square mile area that has about 25,000 residents living in this area. It's a 90 to 150 mile one way trip to get to the emergency room. So I think some of that just recognizing how limited we are for health care uh, contributed to our high vaccination rates. More than 620 miles away in Lamar County on the other side of Texas, it's a different story. Only 40% of residents here are fully vaccinated among the lowest in the state. The county seat is Paris, Texas, home to an Eiffel Tower with a cowboy flair in a small town newspaper that keeps a finger on the pulse of public sentiment. We stopped by to talk to managing editor Clark Bird. Why do you think so many people here are hesitant to get vaccinated? Uh, a lot of it has to do with distrust. There's distrust in the government, distrust in the vaccine makers, uh, distrust based on misinformation that's found on social media sites. Bird has been printing op-eds urging residents to talk to their doctors, but due to a pre-existing health condition, Bird tells us he has not been vaccinated due to his doctor's advice. I've taken a back seat on the vaccine and I continue to mask up, hand sanitize. I take all the precautions that were advised prior to the vaccination uh, being available. Sometimes I'm the only one with a mask and that's concerning, but I maintain my distance with people. Um, you know, if I turn down an aisle at Walmart and there's a bunch of people, I will avoid that aisle and, and wait until it clears out. Casey Cole is in this community and is one of many who has decided not to get a shot. Do you know anybody who's been severely sick or died around here? Um, I do know a few people who have been sick. Um, my wife has actually been one of them who actually uh, caught it and she is not vaccinated. Did that give you pause at all or? It did not. Um, you know, we, we prayed about it and we firmly believe that um, a lot of faith goes in, involved in, in a lot of things we do. I have these spurts of just, uh, but they're my neighbors, you know, so we try to have grace and do the best we can and keep educating and keep them healthy. Dr. Amanda Green is the Lamar County Health Director and the local hospital's chief medical officer. There are some people that I think they'll just never change no matter what. From Dr. Green's perspective, that can be a fatal choice. She points to Ronnie Stanley, the husband of a local nurse who chose not to get vaccinated. He wound up in the ICU and died at the end of September. No one is invincible to this disease. It doesn't care, it doesn't discriminate. Amanda Stanley documented on social media her husband's battle with COVID. You don't have to die. This doesn't, your story doesn't have to end like ours. Um, Ronnie and I, Ronnie and I were married just 11 months ago and I'm, I'm having to deal with him not being here. I'm gonna visit his graveside on our anniversary, you know, and. But that's not anything that we had planned. That's not anything that any newlywed should have to endure. A harrowing account hoping to bring winds of change to this North Texas County. And I've had people that, you know, have been totally against it that have reached out and said, because you told your story and because it's hit home to so many that, yes, they are getting vaccinated. And, and that's my hope that we continue to save another person. In the same state, but in many ways, a world away, back in Presidio County, Dr. Billings says he hasn't seen a single vaccinated patient wind up in the hospital in recent memory. I think, you know, it's about trust. It's about building that relationship with your patients and with your communities. In Texas, Will Carr, ABC News.
Our thanks to Will for that. Still ahead here on Prime, the disturbing body camera footage, a man telling police he is a paraplegic before being dragged out of his car. Dozens of runners caught in a freak snowstorm in the dramatic rescue in the middle of an ultra marathon in Utah. And speaking of marathons, we take a look at the Boston Marathon by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day on this national coming out day, DC Comics reveals Superman's son's new love interest. An extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. World News Now. And America This Morning. The best new video. The breaking news overnight. Emergency crews called to the town of Surfside. U.S. airstrikes hitting targets in Iraq and Syria. The stories people are talking about. You don't want to shave your legs? Don't. I was going to say, oh my. Got it. And what to expect in the day ahead. ABC World News Now and America This Morning. Starting at 2 a.m. Eastern. Up all night to keep you up to date. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions. Straightforward reporting. No spin, no hype, no bull. See why Sunday mornings, more and more Americans are now turning first to ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos. Welcome to This Week. Live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're gonna move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Welcome back, everyone. After more than two years, runners today returned to Boston streets for the annual Boston Marathon. Let's take a look by the numbers. Today marked the 125th running of the iconic Boston Marathon, the world's oldest annual marathon race. It's been 910 days since the last race in 2019 after the pandemic postponed the in-person event in 2020. More than 18,000 runners were expected on the starting line today for the 26.2 mile course in Boston. That includes runners representing 104 countries ranging from 18 to 84 years old. Runners from Kenya took today's top spots in both the men's and women's races, the eighth Kenyan sweep since 2000. The regular field was reduced by 36% compared to recent years to allow for more pandemic social distancing. Either proof of vaccination or a recent negative test result was required for all runners. More than 28,600 runners also participated in virtual marathons in locations around the world over the weekend. A home Red Sox game is usually part of the annual Patriots Day in Boston each spring when the race is typically run. And sports fans were able to take in a thrilling 13-inning Red Sox victory in their playoff series last night before tuning into the marathon today, the first time the race has been run in the fall. And we still have lots to get to here tonight on Prime, with Paul McCartney revealed as the real reason behind the Beatles' breakup and our conversation with the fearless investigative journalist from the Philippines who won the Nobel Peace Prize. But first, to look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com.
is an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcast. The most powerful stories of our time Anytime. Nightline. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime. Cinematic. Real life drama. Stunning. The unthinkable. Follow the clues. The hunt. True crime. 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is what being live is Please all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Okay. Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Today, Merck asking federal regulators to authorize the first antiviral pill to treat COVID-19. Clinical data suggests that for a person testing positive, four pills taken at home every 12 hours for five days can reduce the risk of hospitalization or death by 50%. Across the country, the caseload is down, and with it, the number of patients going to hospitals. But there are still, on average, more than 1,400 new deaths from the virus each day. For Halloween, Dr. Anthony Fauci said outdoor trick-or-treating should be fine, but he urged masking for unvaccinated kids. And this week, the FDA will ponder vaccine boosters for Johnson & Johnson and Moderna recipients. Union workers at tractor maker John Deere appear ready to strike after voting down a new six-year contract with the company. Deere says its offer of on average 5% wage increases would have made its employees pay among the best in the industry. Now the workers have overwhelmingly voted down the contract offer. They counter that the company has been raking in record profits over the past year and that its CEO got a 160% pay increase to about 16 million bucks. A lot of what we've seen is a tight labor market Inflation is rising for, you know, the consumer price index and companies just have been getting away with concessionary contracts, as we call them in the labor movement, contracts that take away more union rights. Uh, and they sort of haven't adopted to the moment of the post pandemic frustration that workers are feeling. The countdown to liftoff is now officially on for the Blue Origins flight that will send William Shatner into space. When the rocket launches, Shatner, at 90 years old, will become the oldest person in space, beating out astronaut Wally Funk. Shatner, of course, played the iconic role of Captain Kirk in the sci-fi series Star Trek. Jeff Bezos, who's the owner of the Blue Origin and traveled into space with Funk earlier this year, is a huge Trekkie. Now, the company did delay liftoff just a day until Wednesday because of high winds. It's a minor setback, but not a long one. I'm deeply disappointed uh, because I was uh, 
building up the the enthusiastic response, and now uh, we've got to wait another day. But as you point out, it is really worth it. What's a day with this extraordinary experience that we're about to have? It's just 11 minutes, but enough to transform a Star Trek actor into a real-life space traveler. Paul McCartney, setting the record straight, says John Lennon broke up the Beatles, not him. In a forthcoming interview with BBC Radio 4, McCartney said, This was my band. This was my job. This was my life. So I wanted it to continue. The 79-year-old said Lennon's decision was driven by his desire to pursue social justice, leaving the remaining members to, quote, pick up the pieces. McCartney says the band would keep the breakup a secret from the public for a few months. People in Illinois caught a glimpse of an odd and whimsical sight that's been spotted in states across the U.S. A man dressed in a bear costume walking just barely down the road. His name is Jesse Larios, but he goes by Bear Son. And he's trying from Los Angeles to New York wearing a bear suit the entire way. How will I be treated, you know? Let, let's see how it goes. And now there's people have been uh, very humane. A lot of humanity out there, a lot of good. Well, Lario started on July 5th and hopes to arrive in Times Square in about a month. Now to the possibility for severe weather that has several major cities in the Midwest right in the crosshairs. This after 12 reported tornadoes damaged buildings near Lawton, Oklahoma. Ginger, we have an active severe weather pattern here. What are you tracking exactly? Lindsay, tonight we've already seen four reported tornadoes in Illinois alone, and there's more where that came from. Two rounds that you can see on the radar there with that tornado watch that includes parts of Indiana. That probably will extend into even southwest Michigan, so watch for that in the next couple of hours. Now, on top of that threat, we've got a new storm that we're watching, and this one already knocked over semi-trucks with 60-mile-per-hour straight-line wind gusts that came along with that. That was on Highway 395 in Nevada, gusts up to 65 miles miles per hour from Henderson to Las Vegas back into Southern California as that low starts to move to the north and east and along the front of it you get severe storms in Kansas and also Nebraska you're going to have heavy snow and we're talking on the order of one to two feet some of those eastern facing slopes will pick up a significant snow for the season really kicking off and a lot of skiers and snowboarders are rejoicing as things are starting to add up but you remember I just mentioned that severe threat as we go through Tuesday this is an enhanced risk so this this is the second level, right, where you see Dodge City down to Woodward. But Wichita to Topeka, you need to be on alert, too. Lindsay? All right, Ginger Z, our thanks to you. The weather next to the dramatic rescue during an ultra marathon in Utah. Dozens of runners were caught in near whiteout conditions by a freak storm and in the middle of a 50-mile race. ABC's Kena Whitworth has the latest on what happened there. Harrowing new video shows a 50-mile ultramarathon race turning into a fight for survival. The roads are pretty slippery here. Got some hunters that are helping out some runners, getting them in vehicles. This is pretty epic. That was epic. Nearly 90 runners had to be rescued off the rugged mountain ridge. Many suffering from hypothermia. You guys doing okay? Several runners underdressed, expecting rain, maybe light snow, but temperatures plummeting to 20 degrees, and the winds picked up to nearly 40 miles an hour, between 12 and 18 inches of snow falling on the runners. It was really, really scary, and there were a group of about 15 with me, and I was saying that I've never been this cold in my entire life, and so we were talking to each other saying, I can't feel my feet, they feel frozen, we just have to keep moving. But race directors, first responders, and volunteers quickly sprung into action. I immediately flipped the switch to becoming race director on the ground, making sure that the finish line was, was pretty and nice to getting on the mountain and counting runners and accounting for every individual on the mountain. Runner Daniel Combs says the hypothermia he developed caused him to fall repeatedly. He almost gave up. The search and rescue unit, they told me that I didn't have much time left when they found me. So that was very scary. The runners that did help me, they were told they probably saved my life. Let's go. Come on, 
I'm sure many of them will be back out on the course this time next year. Our thanks to Kena. On Friday, the Norwegian Nobel Committee awarded the Nobel Peace Prize to two journalists for, quote, their efforts to safeguard freedom of expression, which is a precondition for democracy and lasting peace, along with Russian journalist Dmitry Muratov, Filipino-American journalist Maria Ressa is sharing this year's Peace Prize. A decade ago, she co-founded Rappler, which is a digital media outlet for investigative journalism, which has worked to expose abuses of growing uh, authoritarianism and power in the Philippines. And Maria Ressa, kind enough to join us. Now, first off, huge congratulations to you. Thank you so much, Lindsay, and for having me. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you for talking with us tonight. So you got the call from the Nobel Committee on Friday that you were sharing this honor. Your immediate reaction, we're told, was that you were speechless. Just Take us back to that moment and what was going through your mind and, and, and subsequently in the days since. I was actually on a panel for Southeast Asia. You know, the three news groups, one in Malaysia, one in Indonesia, and us in the Philippines. And we were talking about independent media and how we can survive this time period. And all of a sudden, in the middle of the panel, my phone, you know, started ringing. I asked, I quickly messaged and muted because I saw Norway there. And I thought that maybe they were calling to tell me that, you know, to tell me who the winner was, that I didn't win. And and then as I listened to, to the voice, I just, um, I thought it was ironic that I kept using speech to say I was speechless. You know, I just kept repeating it. And then after that, this... I, I went back on with the other journalists who were watching. I had to stay quiet about it for like 10 to 15 more minutes. And then when the news broke, the anchor announced it. And it was it was like a, a journalist's celebration, which is really wh who this belongs to, right? The last time a journalist won a Nobel Peace Prize was 85 years ago. And, and over time now, I, I kept thinking, you know, this is really... Why? Why now? And it's because of everything we are facing. Um, the last journalist who won this languished in a Nazi concentration camp. And, and right. And and first of all, I just got to say that I love that you're 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 seeing the on the, the caller ID. Norway is calling you, right? So I mean, that was like a big indicator. And then that you have to keep quiet about it for 15 minutes. That must be so difficult. But yeah, to your point, that the, the last time was 85 years ago that a, a journalist actually won. Uh, what message do you think that the Nobel Committee was sending with this award about the current environment facing journalists around the world and, and what you've called the battle for facts? That it's never been as dangerous or as risky as it is today to hold power to account. And really, I thought have a democracy and that I didn't really get to hear the announcement until many, many hours later. But I actually had always said that this is a battle for facts. Uh, if you look at the algorithms of the, the distribution platform for news, American social media companies, um, they prioritize the spread of lies laced with anger and hate over facts. So we're facing an uphill battle. Um, I think that the the biggest game changer is technology. And by by shining the light on journalists now, uh, we've lost the gatekeeping powers to tech. Uh, but the hard part is that tech has taken the revenues, but they've abdicated responsibility for protecting the public sphere. So I hope what this means for journalists around the world is that we gain greater protection to be able to continue reporting the and holding power to account. And you worked for decades at CNN. You've been honored in the past as a time person of the year for your work. But you and your organization, Rappler, have faced arrest warrants and repeated harassment for your coverage of the regime of Philippines President Rodrigo Duterte. Could the detention of this Nobel Award make your work potentially more difficult, or, or does the spotlight actually help you? I... What I learned from the time person of the year, uh, you know, when I first, I heard on Twitter that I was one of the persons of the year. And, and that was when my stomach plunged and I thought that it would mean worse things for me and Rappler. That was in 2018. But we've been living through this since 2016, right? Uh, government attacks both on social media bottom up and then top down from the president himself. And this time around with this giant spotlight of 
the Nobel, I, I'm absolutely certain that like the, the, the previous awards, this is unprecedented for us and will put a shield Right. So we've continued doing our investigative reporting, and this just gave a great shot of adrenaline to not just to Rappler journalists, but to Filipino journalists as we prepare for our May 2022 presidential elections. And President Duterte's office congratulated you today, calling your win, quote, a victory for a Filipina. What's your response to that, given the scrutiny and ongoing legal battles that you face from his regime? Well, let's say the, the presidential spokesman, when he said the congratulations in the next breath, repeated a lie uh, that the government has perpetuated, which is that the cyber libel case filed against me is the individual, is, the, is an individual. You know, what they always neglect to mention is that it is the Department of Justice, it is government prosecutors that are taking the criminal cases forward. In any other time, these cases should have been dismissed outright. So having said that, look, I. Thank you. Um, and it is just such a strange time, but um, I try not to listen to everything and just to, to stay the course, to hold the line, to keep doing our jobs. We appreciate you staying the course. We saw the whistleblower from Facebook testify on Capitol Hill here in the U.S. last week about the influence of that platform allegedly spreading disinformation, something that Facebook has disputed. But talk to us about the outsized role of social media sites like Facebook in the Philippines and how you believe that it distorts the political dialogue. It's not believed. We have the facts, right? Part of the the we're frenemies. Rappler is frenemies with Facebook. We were alpha partners with Facebook in the Philippines, and I think part of the reason that we were able to 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 warn our public in 2016. In 2016, I wrote a piece. It was part of a three part series that talked about how Facebook algorithms impact democracy. We could see it coming. We gave the tape data to Facebook. We continued to gather data. What our data has shown us is that, uh, that when you put facts at the same level, when these algorithms treat facts the same as lies and actually prioritizes the spread of lies, what you do is you break and shatter the shared reality that is necessary for democracy. So what Francis Hogan said is not allegedly the disinformation networks have taken over the information ecosystem on Facebook in the Philippines. And what we've seen is that it isn't just local, it's connected globally, right? In 2018, we showed the link to Russian disinformation networks, to the IRA and to the alt-right in Canada. And just in September, 2020, Facebook did the fourth takedown where they took information operations from China, which was at that point creating fake accounts and using AI generated photos for the US presidential elections. But here in the Philippines, where it was most successful, it was already campaigning for the daughter of President Duterte for president. Our elections are in May. Uh, it was also burnishing the image of the Marcoses, and it was attacking me and Rappler from China. So, you know, there's nothing alleged about it, and we can, the data is there. And what's the challenge, would you say, for independent journalists combating that misinformation, given the wide reach of social media? That we have to stop thinking about this and to also stop taking what the platforms say, to stop thinking about it like it's content. This is algorithmic distribution and algorithmic amplification which, because it is machine, is impossible to deal with, right? So I've, I've talked to so many news heads who, you know, worry about trust. It's no longer in our control. So the first thing we must do is, is demand guardrails be put in place on these platforms. The best uh, one sentence for the crisis we face today comes from an American biologist, E.O. Wilson. And he said that the crisis we are facing is our paleolithic emotions, our medieval institutions, and the godlike technology. So as we move to our presidential elections in May, I have you know, no illusion that we will have the same kind of support from the social media platforms that the U.S. elections had. So I am actually renewing calls Please, for enlightened self-interest, turn up quality news. Um, we need the facts in order to maintain, in order to, to continue democracy. And, and lastly, after all the challenges that you've faced in recent years, are you still optimistic about the role of journalism? And, and what would your message be to a young person who's considering working in the field? 
this is the best time to be a journalist. You know, that and that sounds ironic given that I this is my 35th year as a journalist. And in a little less than two years, I received 10 arrest warrants. My government filed 10 arrest warrants against me. Um, I am 60% of almost half a million attacks on social media aimed to tear down my credibility. But here's the upside. You know, it's kind of like the rest of the world. Journalism is our information ecosystem is in creative destruction. It is the oldest being destroyed. Look at you, your newscast, the first streaming newscast, right? As the old world is being destroyed, the new world is being created. So this is an amazing time. I just wish that I it wasn't demanding so much from journalists. And I think that's what the Nobel Committee saw. You know, so we sacrifice to get through this time period. Uh, the other effort is to try to help independent media survive. It's part of the reason I agreed to be the co-chair of the International Fund for Public Interest Media, uh, along with the former CEO of the New York Times, Mark Thompson. We aim to raise from ODA funds a billion dollars a year to help independent media survive. You're going to need both guardrails on tech and then help for media because the advertising model has crumbled. Maria Ressa, just such a pleasure to talk to you, co-winner of the 2021 Nobel Peace Prize. Thank you so much for coming on the show tonight. Thanks for having me, Lindsay. Before we go tonight, our image of the day. Take a look at this house in northern Bosnia. It's being described as a, a monument of love, sort of. Clearly not in the grandeur of, say, the Taj Mahal. But this home with its green exterior and red metal roof represents one man's attempt to finally make his wife happy by allowing their house to rotate so that she can see a different view depending on the time of day. That is love, folks. To my husband, you see that there? Happy wife, happy life. That is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, we're staying on top of a few things. How the cures for so many ailments can be found in the natural world. We speak with a researcher in search of some. And we're on the set of a television rarity. Although it shouldn't be, we go behind the scenes to see nearly all indigenous cast of the new comedy Reservation Dogs and learn about the new generation of actors demanding change in Hollywood. This is what being live is Three, all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb movie. shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. The ladies you love, the hottest topics happening now. There's only one place to find it all. You guys are having the hard conversations. I love The View. The most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live.
Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart they did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. Hey there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. For the first time since the U.S. left Afghanistan, an American delegation has held closed-door talks with the Taliban. The U.S. raised concerns about security there, the terror threat, and the evacuation of U.S. citizens and Afghan partners. The Taliban says the U.S. agreed to provide humanitarian aid, although U.S. officials claim it will go directly to people and not the Taliban government, which the U.S. does not recognize. Investigators say they have found a body in the middle of the Yucca Valley Desert. That's the area where Lauren Cho from New Jersey disappeared two months ago after walking away from a rental house. The cause of death has yet to be determined as the coroner's office works to identify the remains. And Surf City USA, as it's lovingly called, is back open more than a week after an oil spill shut down a popular California beach. Officials say new tests showed no detectable levels of oil toxins in the waters off Huntington Beach. Next to the small plane, it plunged into a California community with deadly consequences. ABC's Will Carr has more. A plane hit. Oh, my God. Tonight, the oh urgent search and rescue playing out throughout the fierce flames and thick smoke. It shook my whole entire, oh, my God, I got to get out of here. A small twin-engine plane slamming into two homes and a delivery truck. Exploding into a fireball just blocks away from a high school in the city of Santee, just outside of San Diego. There's like two houses on fire right now and a UPS truck. One of the houses, we got two residents out. And the other house, I'm not sure. And the UPS driver's whereabouts are on at this time. There was also a UPS driver out in the street getting ready to make his deliveries. The truck was just basically ripped open like a tin can. Moments ago, authorities confirming at least two people killed including that UPS driver, several people rushed to the hospital. Not to be too too graphic, but it's a, it's a pretty brutal scene uh, for our guys. We believe that the injuries are non-survivable. Witnesses describing the terrifying scene. All I heard was a scream like, oh, the airplane was just screeching, just ee! And I go, okay, that's not normal. And I look up and boom. Neighbors rushing in, rescuing an elderly man and woman from one of the homes, both suffering from burns. What I heard was a very loud bang and the house shook. Images revealing the devastation. At least two homes nearly burned to the ground. Lindsay, tonight the big question for authorities here is why. You can still see that charred truck behind me. It is right in front of those two homes. And UPS just released a statement saying it is broken hearted tonight for the loss of its employee. Lindsay. Will, thank you. And now we go to Texas, where three-year-old Christopher Ramirez is safe at home after following the family dog into the woods and going missing for four days. ABC's Marcus Moore spoke exclusively with a man who police say was a good Samaritan who found him. And tonight, Marcus brings us the latest. Tonight, a moment of celebration in this Texas town. Three-year-old Christopher Ramirez is finally home. His mother, Araceli Nunez, holding on tight to her son. Estoy muy contenta de tener a mi hijo en mis brazos. Christopher was found Saturday morning after he was missing for four days. The child was found alive. He is alive. He's thirsty. He's with his mother and he's going to the hospital. A landowner, Tim Halfen, found him in a thick wooded area five miles from his home after hearing about the missing boy during Bible study, setting out to search for Christopher on his own. I'm walking back down the pipeline toward where I live and I hear that noise. And now I'm saying, Christopher, and then he responds. <laughs> this image taken Saturday of Christopher reunited with his mom. I asked her about that moment. ¿Cómo fue ese momento para usted? No puedo explicarles con palabras. She calls his discovery a miracle. And tonight, the little boy who survived, who loves police officers and firefighters, is now the Grimes County Sheriff's Office's newest member. It's my honor to pin him the badge, junior deputy badge. 
Well deserved our thanks to Marcus for that. And now to one of the world's top fashion designers revealing in an Instagram post his shocking injuries from a fireplace explosion one year ago. ABC's Maggie Rooley has this story. One of the world's most influential fashion designers, Olivier Rouston, known for dressing stars like Beyonce, Rihanna, and Justin Bieber, is opening up about the terrifying moment his fireplace exploded in his Paris home exactly one year ago. Posting this intimate photo on Instagram from his recovery, showing his entire torso and both arms wrapped in bandages with severe burns on his face. Writing, I finally feel ready to share this. I've been hiding this for too long, and it's time for you to know. For a year, he says he hid his injuries behind face masks and turtlenecks, trying everything to hide what happened from as many people as possible. Saying, to be honest, I'm not really sure why I was so ashamed. Maybe this obsession with perfection that fashion is known for, and my own insecurities. Rouston celebrating his 10-year anniversary runway show for Belmont just a week before opening up about his injuries. Now we know there was real meaning behind it. It represented freedom. The dresses that hit the runway looked like literal bandages. He put a lot of his journey and his pain into these couture creations. Beloved by fellow fashion designers and celebrities, many now reaching out in support. Donatella Versace writing, I'm so glad you're safe. Kim Kardashian and Kylie Jenner posting their love and their mom Chris Jenner writing, you have been so strong and so positive through it all. I am beyond proud of you. Rouston didn't give details on the extent of his injuries or exactly how the accident happened, but the fashion boss seems determined to stay positive, writing, now a year later, healed, happy, and healthy, I realize how truly blessed I am, and I thank God every day of my life. He's breaking down the stigma, he's being real and raw. Ultimately, it's helping to destigmatize what this ideal of perfection at the fashion industry puts out there. Our thanks to Maggie for that. President Biden became the first president to issue a proclamation recognizing today as Indigenous Peoples Day, while also noting the, quote, painful history of wrongs by European explorers brought to Native communities in a separate proclamation marking Columbus Day, an acknowledgment of the complex history of this country. Film and television have often not been factual in their portrayal of an Indigenous people over the years, but the creators of the new comedy Reservation Dogs went on a mission to try to change all that. As ABC's Kaylee Hartung reports. On a recent night in Hollywood, a groundbreaking premiere. For the first time, a TV show filmed almost entirely with indigenous actors. Yo! Hey! Indy Mafia telling everybody told them y'all was the reservation dogs since y'all didn't like res bandits. Produced, written, and directed by an indigenous crew. That's my auntie. And filmed on indigenous land. When I looked along the the whole step and repeat and red carpet and looking at every stop and everybody being interviewed were all indigenous creatives. That was so empowering and like a oh my god moment to see. I, I wouldn't have thought, you know, I would ever be part of something so so massive and like so groundbreaking. But uh here we here we are. You have all these amazing kids. Um, none of them look alike. They're all representing different facets of what an Indigenous teenager would be like. Hey, everyone out there in Indian Territory, Oklahoma. It's a dark comedy called Reservation Dogs, Crazy now streaming on FX on Hulu. Hey, we're selling meat pies outside if y'all want any. Yeah. Hey, y'all, this girl with stomach pains is selling meat pies. Y'all want any? The show becoming an instant hit already renewed for a second season. Its young stars even joining Hollywood's A-listers at last night's Emmy Awards. We are here on television's biggest night as creators and actors, proud to be indigenous people working in Hollywood. Set on the Muscogee Nation Reservation in Oklahoma. Somebody ripped all the damn copper out of 20 different street lamps. Yo, hurry up. Mom! Where a group of Native American teenagers are trying to scrape together enough money to travel to the promised land of California, their way of coming to terms with the tragic death of their friend. Can either of you imagine the impact it would have had on you as a kid to see a show like Reservation Dogs on your television? <laughs> Probably would have started acting a lot earlier, you know? you know? I wish we could have had a show like this as a kid growing up. It's one of the roles that I'm most proud of playing. Mm -hmm. 28-year-old Devry Jacobs plays Alora Daniels, the ringleader of the group, happy to finally be in her element.
too often have I been the only Indigenous person on set, let alone queer Indigenous person on set. And I was really getting used to feeling isolated and lonely. And even though I was really proud of the projects that I was a part of, they never hit close enough to home for me like Reservation Dogs did. Are you crazy horse or sitting? No, 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 I'm not one of those awesome guys. No, I'm more of your, uh, I'm more of your unknown warrior. Keeping yeah. true to you know Native American culture. William Knifeman. <laughs> the show injects humor the by way of necessity right. into each episode. The show is about celebrating our communities and indigenous comedy and the way that we've coped with 500 years of colonization and genocide is, is by laughing it off and making fun of each other. <laughs> Where does the story come from? <laughs> the show was created by Sterling Harjo in collaboration with his longtime friend and Oscar winner Taika Waititi. For Harjo, filming on the indigenous land where he grew up has been years in the making. Oklahoma is a very unique place. There's 38, 39 tribes there right now. You drive an hour in any direction, you're in a new tribal territory with new languages, new customs, and that's smack dab in a, a very conservative state. But this is a project where the location obviously informs yeah. everything about what we're seeing yeah. on the screen. You yeah. couldn't manufacture that somewhere Yeah, and else. I mean, you know, it is a character. And, it, and I, think, I think actually the Oklahoma as a location is part of what people are responding to when they say they've never seen anything like this. And we all face different experiences. We all have friends that committed suicide in our communities. You know, health issues is a big issue in Native communities. Lack of water, lack of, lack of resources, all, all of these things um, that come with surviving attempted genocide. People have been encouraging BIPOC voices and have been looking for, for BIPOC voices and have r quickly realized that where is the I in BIPOC? Where are our indigenous folks? Why aren't we allowing space for them? And, and now we're finally being granted space to share our stories. According to UCLA's Hollywood Diversity Report, Native Americans landed just 0.3% of all top film roles in 2018 and 0.5% in 2019. Native women did not account for any of those roles in that time. I grew up seeing people that represented me being shot off horses constantly. As recently as the 1990s, Native actors were largely stereotyped. How would you describe how you've seen Native people portrayed on screen until now? Native people are the zombies. We are the walking dead of Westerns. We are the thing that's in the way of Western expansion. And I think a lot of that has to do with guilt about the attempted genocide of our people. And we, I think that in general, people don't wanna see us as humans because that makes you feel bad. The history of problematic Native characters. What's your crime, boy? Indian. And whitewash representation on camera has even led to backlash. Johnny Depp came under sharp criticism following his 2013 portrayal of Tonto in The Lone Ranger. Princess Tiger Lily. Two years later, a similar firestorm when actress Rooney Mara was cast as Tiger Lily in Pan. It's a role Mara says she regrets, telling The Telegraph, I really hate, hate, hate that I am on that side of the whitewashing conversation. I can understand why people were upset and frustrated. Strides are being made. In 2019, Wes Studi made history as the first Native American to receive an Academy Award. I'd simply like to say, it's about time. <laughs> to the cast and crew of the Reservation Dogs, that pivotal moment in representation was just the beginning. It's very obvious to see in Reservation Dogs, there's talent on screen and behind the screen, and it's always been there. It just hasn't been nurtured or given the opportunity to be in these places, to be able to make these shots, to be able to hire these people to tell these stories. So what impact do you hope this show can have on kids who are growing up just like you did, but now get a chance to see you. I hope it shows non-Indigenous people that we're just normal. All people need are opportunities to be heard. There are amazing stories if we're open to hearing them. And we thank Kaylee for sharing that story with us. And still to come, what British law enforcement will not do that has some in the UK calling for Britain's monarchy to be abolished. Stay with us. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. 
right, we're gonna move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not them. afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> I hug you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. This is American history, a violent white mob, a brutal attack, 300 black Americans killed right here in America. Now, it is time to uncover Tulsa's buried truth, the gripping story brought to light in a new podcast from ABC News, available now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Sex, gambling, fraud, betrayal, and murder. Cutthroat Inc., the podcast. The a family truth. on a mission to find their son. A year's worth of conversations with the killer cutthroat ink subscribe for free now on your favorite podcast app Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. Now with so much on the line, more Americans are turning to David Muir and ABC's World News Tonight than any other program across all of television. Welcome back. We're tracking several international headlines at this hour. Iraqi forces say they've detained a top ISIS leader and longtime al-Qaeda operative. Iraq's prime minister tweeting the news identifying Sami Jassim as the man who oversaw the Islamic State group's financial operations. Jassim has a $5 million bounty on his head from the State Department. To the UK now in a major development in the sexual assault allegations against Prince Andrew. London police say they have concluded their review of the civil case against Prince Andrew and will be taking no further action. News of the decision lit up social media with calls to abolish the monarchy as users speculate it was connected to Andrew's royal background and not the facts laid out in the case. The beleaguered prince has denied all allegations against him. And Sydney, Australia is loosening COVID restrictions after that nation's largest city achieved a vaccination benchmark with 70% of the area's population over the age of 16 now fully vaccinated. More than 90% have received at least one dose. We turn now to the world of medicine and the search for new treatments. While some drugs are created using synthetic ingredients in the lab, others like aspirin and some anti-malaria drugs are derived from plants, harnessing the power of nature to fight disease. Here to explain is Dr. Cassandra Quave, a pioneering medical ethnobotanist and professor at Emory University. Her new book, The Plant Hunter, a scientist's quest for nature's next medicines, comes out next week. Welcome to the show, Dr. Quave. Thank you for having me. So your book is part science and part memoir, starting off when you were born with multiple congenital defects. Tell us about your journey and, and what you had to overcome from day one. Yeah, well, I think when I was born, my parents' greatest desire was that I could someday walk. I don't think that they could have ever imagined that I would not only walk, but travel the world looking for plants and kind of filling up that passion that I have for, for discovery. Um, I was born with um, missing some bones in my leg. Other bones were very short. And eventually, um, at the age of three, we had an amputation of the leg so that I could walk with the prosthetic. And you fell in love with the field of medical ethnobotany, the use of plants and medical treatment, which requires some work in some far-flung places. There were a lot of challenges for you, such as uh, working in remote locations, being a woman in a male-dominated field, and managing a physical disability as well. Why were you drawn to this particular career? 
in college, I was a pre-medical student. I was a double major in biology and anthropology. But what I wasn't able to find was this connection between these fields until I traveled to the Amazon rainforest when I was um, a rising senior in college. And there I had this amazing opportunity to study with a local shaman, a healer that relied on plants as his major forms of medicine. And it was during that experience that I really realized that instead of going into the practice of medicine, my true path was in the discovery um, of new medicines from nature. And, and let's talk about the science of it all. You write that 33,000 or 9% of the world's plant species are used for medicinal purposes. Many people are going to immediately think about marijuana, for example, but, but tell us about some of those other plants and why they're important to the future of medicine, as well as marijuana, and, and you, what you feel that that role should be as far as medicine is concerned. Yeah, that's a great question. I think when it comes to the scientific understanding of plants, we have barely scratched the surface. And that's because plants are incredibly chemically complex. Billions of people across the globe, when they are ill, they don't go to the pharmacy. They go to nature to find medicines to treat um, anything from minor you know, stomach aches to more severe and serious infections. Some of our best drugs for infection, for cancer, for pain, all were originally discovered in plants. And while they may be today produced in a factory setting, um, the original chemical blueprints came from those plants. In your lab, you're studying the Brazilian pepper tree, something that you found in your home state of Florida. What's the potential of the pepper tree? Yeah, I mean, the pepper tree is this funny um, plant because in Florida, it's actually a really hated species. It's considered a noxious weed and people want to get rid of it. But historically, going back into records that were written in Latin um, in the 1600s, we found evidence of its use in treating um, everything from kind of internal problems to topically being applied to treat infected wounds and ulcers. And because the focus of my research group at Emory is really on discovering new um, ingredients to fight infectious disease, I get really excited about any records um, concerning plants for serious infections, and especially skin infections. What we've found in the Brazilian pepper tree is in the fruits, we've actually identified a number of compounds that can stop a deadly pathogen known as MRSA by blocking its ability to produce these horrific toxins that destroy our tissues. And for me, my battle against MRSA is really personal. You know, when I had my leg amputated at the age of three, I almost died from a staph infection that I acquired in the hospital. And you know, many people still deal with getting um, hospital-acquired infections or even community-acquired infections from staph aureus. And it's one of those threats that needs, you know, more, we need more tools in our arsenal to fight it. As an expert in plants, tell us what you've learned about their importance that, that some of us might be missing. And I want to go back, because I think we overlooked it in, in the initial question about marijuana, because that in particular is a very controversial plant. I'd uh, like to get a sense from you as far as you, the value there. I mean, I think cannabis has tremendous value. It's had tremendous value for millennia um, when it's been used, you know, not only as a source of a psychoactive, you know, properties of the plant, but also its uses in fibers and cordage. Um, but it's just one of many, many species that people have come to use to relieve different sorts of, of, of problems. And, you know, at the same time, there are some serious issues around the cannabis industry um, because of the way that it's regulated and because of the restrictions that are placed on scientists like myself. It's very difficult to get permits to study um, cannabis in a laboratory setting, even though it's widely available on the street um, or in um, some states where it's been legalized. It can be quite challenging to study it in the lab. Dr. Cassandra Quaid, we thank you so much for your time and joining us tonight. The Plant Hunter, a scientist's quest for nature's next medicines, is out next week. Available now for pre-order wherever books are sold. Turning now to a new coffee shop in Charlotte, North Carolina, aiming to hire people with disabilities and learning challenges. Anthony Costaro with our affiliate WSOC has more on the owners who hope it's the connection that keeps customers coming back. <laughs> Enter Biddy and Bo's coffee shop along Camden Road in South Bend. Have a great day. Thank you, sir. You'll notice that warm welcome and these handwritten cups. You may also notice this. So we have 35 employees with disabilities. Amy Sonamo owns the Charlotte Biddy and Bo's franchise, whose mission is to employ people with various disabilities. 
like her son who has a neurological disorder. We are doing this for him, we are doing it as a family, and we are doing it for the community with disabilities as well. The mission started when Amy Wright opened the first store in Wilmington back in 2017. It's nice to see you. That's her here for the Charlotte opening. Her own children, Biddy and Bo, have Down syndrome and struggle to find jobs. Sanamo hopes other companies take notice. Um, and I want them to consider hiring people with disabilities in their business. This new work is giving employees like Jack Davis a sense of independence and purpose. Well, getting a chance to talk to people and also just try to get their orders in as fast as I can and just, just help them along the way. <laughs> Not only are they serving up a good cup of coffee, your, your uh, coffee's ready. They're also serving up endless possibilities. That's our ultimate goal is to show Charlotte what our employees are capable of. Super sweet. Our thanks to Anthony for that. And that is our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night. extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself in.